and I'll break down the unit for you in a little bit after we've done, after we've finished going over any questions you have from yesterday's work, but there's not much to this unit. There really isn't. When you look at the content, um, it, it boils down to a bit two or three different topics in general. Where the review comes in is doing the math. And now, you've heard me say before, the way you get better at math is to do math. Now even more so than before, that's true. Yesterday what we were looking at is logarithmic differentiation. And if you look at page 395, question number one, all of these functions are functions that you could differentiate without use of logarithms or logarithmic differentiation. But using logarithmic differentiation makes it easier. For example, I'm going to pick on f here. If you wanted to differentiate y is equal to x squared plus 1 over x squared plus 4 raised to the 1 half, it's, it's not a huge, cumbersome job to use the power rule combined with the chain rule combined with the quotient rule. It isn't. It's something that everybody should be able to do. However, if we were to use logarithmic differentiation, this is what would happen. You would take the natural logarithm of both sides. So we'd have ln y equals ln of this x squared plus 1 over x squared plus 4 raised to the half. Um, because this is just the first thing I'm showing you today, I'm going to go a little slower and be sure to show every step. Your next step would be to move that exponent down in front. This move, I, I always say this because I think it's important, this move of moving that exponent down in front has nothing to do with differentiation. It's just the property of logarithms. Um, I think we had this discussion yesterday, but the number was a third. Uh, I, I think most of you understand that you can deal with that half in a number of different ways. I really like for students to grab on to this idea of multiplying both sides by two. I just find that for some students, unless they do that, they tend to make a mistake someplace. Maybe they don't multiply that one half through everything. So I prefer to get rid of it. You don't have to. You can leave it there. And then since I have a logarithm of a quotient, you have a rule that says the logarithm of a over b is equal to the logarithm of a minus the logarithm of b. So I can rewrite the rest of this as ln of x squared plus 1 minus ln of x squared plus 4. And now I'm ready to differentiate. Ben. Just a second. Uh, can you start again, please? Yeah, you could. I, I think sometimes it's more trouble than it's worth. Like, uh, okay, let's just take a break here from this for a second. And let's say that I asked you to differentiate, and I've never actually explored this before, but I think what I'm going to do is give you an example that if we use logarithmic differentiation, it's actually more work. Okay, um, but let's say I asked you to differentiate the following. I better not use 2x. Okay, and, and I want you to differentiate that. Of course, we know, let me set this up for cloning. Give me a second. We know that differentiating this is not a big deal. Um, so prior to learning about logarithms and logarithmic differentiation, you would have just said that dy dx is 6 times 4x squared plus 3x raised to the 5 times 8x plus 3. 
And, you know, you might move that 8x plus 3 and wedge it between the 6 and the other factor. If you use logarithmic differentiation, then you would have ln of y, and I'm going to um, just cut a little corner here. I'm going to bring that 6 down right now. So I would take the natural logarithm of this, but the 6 comes in front. I shouldn't say that doing it this way is going to be, see, and I almost, see what I almost did there? I almost changed it to the 5. Uh, I'm not differentiating. That's all I'm doing. Now what I can do is say that I have 1 over y dy dx equals 6 times 1 over 4x squared plus 3x multiplied by 8x plus 3. Are you with me on what I've done there? Okay. So now what you do with logarithmic differentiation is you move that y out of the way because we want dy dx. We don't want to know what dy dx times 1 over y is. So you end up with dy dx equals y times 6 times 8x plus 3. Wow. Times 8x plus 3 over 4x squared plus 3x. And then you're going to put y back in. But y was 4x squared plus 3x to the 6. It's, it's moderately a little bit more work. Because now what you're going to have is dy dx is 6 times y, which is up here in the top right corner. And that's 4x squared plus 3x to the 6. Then we have our 8x plus 3. And it's over 4x squared plus 3x, and that's to the 1. So you see what's about to happen here? that I have 4x squared plus 3x to the 1 in the numerator and 4x squared plus 3x to the 6 in the denominator and 4x squared plus 3x to the 6 in the numerator. So that's going to cancel and it's going to give us this thing. I would say that you would use logarithmic differentiation if it avoids the product and quotient rules with exponents. Um, but again, you know, as I think about that, I'm, I'm really hesitant in suggesting that because I still believe that if you had something like that, the quotient rule is going to be the quickest route still, I think. Because, listen, when you get to the bottom of these things, do you, I'm going to bring up the one from yesterday that I think is an important one. I don't, maybe I didn't save it. Looks like I didn't save it. We had one yesterday where our derivative had uh, cotan, had cos x over sine x, and we had something over x squared plus 1, and we had something over x plus 5 or whatever. And I said, we don't want to bring those back together with a common denominator. It's too much work, and it defeats the purpose. Okay. If you were to differentiate this, everyone, using logarithmic differentiation, I would expect you to put all of those things together with a common denominator, which means you might as well just use the quotient rule to begin with. Okay. Uh, now, I'm going to go back to this question because this was where we were at. We've simply applied a natural logarithm to both sides and rewritten this. Now what we get is 2 times the derivative of ln of y, which is 1 over y dy dx, equals 1 over x squared plus 1 times 2x, because the derivative of the natural logarithm of a thing is 1 over that thing times the derivative of that thing. And I've forgotten who asked. Oh, nobody asked. I just decided to do this. Right. Minus 1 over x squared plus 4 times the derivative of x squared plus 4, which is 2x. So what I end up with is 
dy dx equals one half. I'm moving this two back down times y. I'm multiplying both sides by y times 2x over x squared plus 1 minus 2x over x squared plus 4. Okay. Now, I did mention that when you get to this stage, whether you put y back in or not is up to you. I don't care. I, I don't like putting it in. It just makes it more complicated to look at. But I did mention you don't have to simplify it. There's limits to that idea. I mean, I think you should notice that there's a factor of two you could take out of those two terms and cancel with the half. Or if I multiply that half through, one half times two x is x, one half times two x is x. So I think the best answer for something like this would be y times x over x squared plus one minus x over x squared plus 4. Whether you decide to take that x out or not is entirely up to you. And I can't, I, I racked my brain yesterday, and I'm racking it now for a case where it would help. Can't get it. But if you took that x out, and y, which is right in front, had a factor of x in the denominator, then you'd want to you know, walk down that path so you could cancel those x's. But I don't think you can, because y was a square root. Anyway, that's the first case. And the second case, I'm going to warn you right now, the second type of problem with logarithmic differentiation is exemplified in question two here. And I'm going to warn you right now that on the exam, there will be some written response question that involves differentiating something where logarithmic differentiation is required. And I'm not going to tell you, use logarithmic differentiation. There, there are, you know, and I, I, I believe you understand this, what we're learning in this course is really pretty limited. It's a, a very large, voluminous catalog of calculus that we're learning. But there's a lot more. There's mountains more. Okay. Um, but in this course, any time you have a function of x raised to a function of x, you have to use logarithmic differentiation. Those are going to be, that will be the only case where you must use logarithmic differentiation. There are other situations where it would help but that's the only case. So what you would do here is take the log of both sides so that you could move the exponent down in front and use essentially what is the product rule. So all that being said, I'm not going to spend time here going over a specific one here, but are there any, either from one, two, or three, that anybody would like me to go over? Arden? One C. Okay, so we have y equals e to the x squared multiplied by x cubed multiplied by x squared plus 8. And that's raised to the 4. I'm just writing it there so I can see it. I'm going to do all my work down here. We are in review mode for this exam on Thursday, so it's important that you pay attention to this bit of business that I think is causing a problem for you in this question. There will definitely be questions on the exam on Thursday where if you don't understand how to simplify something first, it will become more complicated later. Maybe so complicated that you can't climb out of the problem to get to the answer. Okay, So we, we definitely start by taking the natural logarithm of both sides. And that means I'm going to have the natural logarithm of, and it will be e to the x squared, multiplied by x cubed, multiplied by x squared plus 8, raised to the 4. And we have a rule for logarithms, a logarithm of a, b, c is the logarithm of a plus the logarithm of b plus the logarithm of c. 
called the product law, and I've just extended it to three factors. The logarithm of a product is equal to the sum of the logarithms. And that means that I can now write ln y equals the natural logarithm of e to the x squared, brackets optional, plus the natural logarithm of x cubed, again brackets optional, plus the logarithm of x squared plus 8 raised to the 4, large set of brackets optional. We've had that conversation, you and I. So what can I do with the second two terms on the right-hand side? I can write this ln of x cubed as 3 ln x in preparation for taking the derivative of 3 times the ln of x. I can write this term as 4 times the natural logarithm of x squared plus 8. I would say this set of brackets here on the last term that I just wrote are not really optional. You, you probably should have them. And of course, we have ln y here. But you need to recognize that the natural logarithm of e to the x squared is just x squared. In fact, there was something on the quiz you wrote where you didn't take the natural logarithm of both sides, but I think you had, I'll bring up the quiz and show you. Right here on the bottom of your screen, I've got y equals ln of e to the 2x. Ln of e to the 2x is 2x. And some of you recognize that after you differentiated, then you changed it to 2x. But if you change it to 2x before, then it becomes a lot simpler. e to the a natural logarithm of our inverse operations. So now this is what we have. Now I can differentiate. I have 1 over y dy dx. The derivative of x squared is just 2x. Nothing fancy going on there. The derivative of 3 ln x is 3 times 1 over x. And I noticed, looking at some of your work over the past couple of days, many of you just write 3 over x. Right? And that's OK. That's what it is. And then this will be plus 4 times 1 over x squared plus 8 multiplied, of course, by the derivative of the argument of the logarithm. The derivative of that would be 2x. Um, there's really not much else to this other than to bring that y back and throw a set of brackets around the whole thing. And, you know, dust it up a bit, make it a little shinier by, you know, writing 8x over x squared plus 8, for example. So we end up with y times, in big set of brackets, 2x plus 3 over x plus 8x over x squared plus 8. Does that do it for you, Arden? OK. Farhad? What if you forget that ln of e to the 2x is 2x, and you try to bring the 2x in front of the ln of e? Would you have to use a part? Well, it will still work, but at some point, I would expect you to clean things up. Um, so we're, we're talking here about ln of e to the 2x, right? That, let's forget about everything else, because that's what we're... e to the x squared? OK. So this is what we're talking about, correct? So well, let's imagine this is y. You, you still... You cannot use the power rule here. I just want to make that clear. You cannot wrap the exponent around something and drop one from the exponent. But since this is a natural logarithm, we can use the power law for natural logarithms, which says, I don't know what letters I've chosen on your formula sheet, but it says that, right? So w this thing has already got a logarithm on it, so we're not introducing a logarithm. 
we can move this down and write y equals x squared ln of e. Now, ln of e is 1. And I think if you were to start to use the product rule here or something, you, you're missing the point because ln of e is just 1. It could be that you're, what you're wondering, though, is what if, let's go back here, um, where is it? There it is. What if I think I can erase this now. You could be asking, what if you did this? Am I right in assuming that's what you were wondering about? Like I'm taking the derivative of a natural logarithm, so it's going to be 1 over that argument, times the derivative of that argument. Well, what's the derivative of e to the x squared? It's e to the x squared times the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. Well, you're left with 2x no matter what. So I guess it doesn't really matter as long as I don't see in any answers natural logarithm of e to the x squared. And I, I can't quite figure out how some of you got that, but you ended up having those as part of your answers in this quiz, uh, except it was 2x in the quiz. Uh, so other questions? Go ahead, JV. 1f, OK. Didn't I, didn't I do 1f at the beginning of the class when I reviewed what we were doing? Uh, if you're really bent on seeing it, watch the video that I will publish to YouTube later, but I'm not going to do it a second time. I think I chose F as an example and I did it. Grant? Uh, 2B. 2B, okay. So we're finally on to ones that require logarithmic differentiation. It's not just, well, we can use it to make our jobs easier. You said B, correct, Grant? Okay. So we have for 1B y is equal to the base is x and the exponent on the power is x to the half. And, and we know by now that you do not want to write radicals in functions. You would rather write exponents, uh, fractional exponents in preparation for differentiation. So because this cannot be stated enough, because it's a power of a power, there is no rule. This isn't an option. If I say differentiate this, there is only one way that you can do so, and it's to start by taking the natural logarithm of both sides. Now, you know, I guess math is a technical science. There is another way you could take the base 10 log of both sides, but you could take the base any log of both sides. But I prefer natural logarithm because it's easier to differentiate, and that's why we use it. Is that okay so far, Grant? Okay, all I do now is I swing that exponent down, and again, this has nothing whatsoever to do with any kind of differentiation rule. It's only a property of logarithms, that the logarithm of a power, power is a base to an exponent, the logarithm of a power is equal to the exponent on the power multiplied by the logarithm of the base. Now I can use the product rule because x squared ln x is a product of x squared and ln x. And at some point here, and I think it might have just happened, you get where to go from here, but I'm going to complete the explanation anyway. Okay? So the derivative of ln of y is 1 over y. The chain rule says you have to multiply by the derivative of the argument of the logarithm. The argument is y, the derivative of y is dy dx. It's implicit differentiation. Now I'm going to say that's equal to, and again, I've said this before, you have to follow the rules. You can't just, as my mom would say, willy-nilly, just differentiate everything everywhere. Well, she wouldn't have said differentiate, but she would have said willy-nilly. You have to follow the rules. So the derivative of x to the half is 1 half, x raised to the negative 1 half, times the natural logarithm of x, plus the second half of the product rule says now you multiply, now you add the first times the derivative of the second 
So the first is x to the half, the derivative of the second is 1 over x. I think you have all learned accidentally that as we get into more and more types of functions, you know, we started off with polynomials to differentiate. Then we got into rational functions. Then we got into radical functions. You get into exponential trigonometric logarithmic. The deeper you wade into this, the less likely it is that you can simplify the resulting derivative. You start to get all of these different moving parts that don't really fit together very well. But we'll do our best. dy dx here, I'm going to move the y over, and I'm going to work on simplifying what I have here. Now, I'm tempted to just write the following. And I've done a couple of things there. I brought the y over, obviously. The 1 half multiplied by x to the negative 1 half multiplied by ln x. These three things are all being multiplied together. So I'm multiplying fractions, basically. I have 1 over 2 times 1 over x to the half times ln x. And I get that. Here, what I'm doing, I don't know. How many of you, just by a wink and a nod to tell me, see that that's x to the half on the bottom because you have an x to the 1 on the bottom. If you don't see that, I suppose you could say that that's equal to x to the half minus 1. That's your rule for dividing by common bases. You take the numerator exponent minus the denominator. This gives you x to the negative half, which is 1 over x to the half. And I really hear everybody, uh, we're, we're kind of done. We're kind of done. I don't know how far the author went, but I see the opportunity here to make a common denominator very easily. It's not a big deal. It really isn't. I just have to multiply the top and the bottom of this by 2. And, and to me, that just seems a little cleaner as an answer. If you stop there in what's written in brown, that's, that's fine. There's no problem there. I get dy dx equals y, and then I can write this as ln of x plus 2 over 2. Might as well go back to the radical 2 root x. Is that OK? What, what kind of answer does the author have, Grant? You got y negative 1 half, 1 half, ln of x plus 1 over x. Yeah, that's right. Same thing? Yeah, that's right. Same thing? Yeah. OK. So you're satisfied with that? Other questions? Liam? Can I get 1e? 1e, certainly. Oh, no, 2e, OK. And again, don't these functions are interesting. I find, as soon as I see ln of x quantity to the x, I find that interesting. I can't wrap my head around quite what it would look like. But that's maybe a tip to you that when you get one of these bizarre things, logarithmic differentiation is what's called for. I'm going to take the logarithm of both sides. Whoa, just a second here. Yeah, that's OK. See, even as I, even as I began to do this, well, I have to write it down. And then I have to wrap my head around it. I, I, my brain is maybe racing ahead a little bit and trying to figure out what it's going to become, but I should just stop and say, the first step is to take the natural logarithm of both sides. So I have ln of y equals the ln of the ln of x to the x. And by ln of x to the x, I mean the ln of x to the x. Again, I really wish somebody would have adopted this notation. Yep. Why are you we can't. We can't move that x in front yet. And, and this is something that, and it's been a while since you've taken 30-1, but for people who have just finished logarithms, this might be more 
memorable. I'm not going to talk about X here. I'm just going to use other letters. If I have a log of, if I have this, and Arden has asked about this a couple of times, both in this class and in my Math 30 class, what does that mean? And what that means, and this is where I get a little sloppy in 30-1, I write this. I'm trying not to do it anymore. What that means when you see that is this. So when we have this and we say, oh, we swing that exponent down and I'm just applying a rule of logarithms, no derivatives, you can only do that if the exponent is on a base in the argument. So going back to this, and I know you get this now, but this is a confusing one. If E meant something different, uh, I'm going to call this G, if I had Y equals ln of X to the X, then there's, um, it's implied that that's the case, in which case you would be right in saying we don't need to take the natural logarithm of both sides because we just see, and now I'm going back to the other thing again, we can just swing that down in front. And this is where I was caught up here. I don't know if you remember when I was writing this down, I, I, I was said my mind was racing ahead and I'm, I'm I'm really thinking hard about this because I wanted to do that. I so wanted to bring that x down. But what I can do now <laughs> is bring that x down in front of this logarithm because that x is an exponent on the argument of the green logarithm. So Liam, you had asked about this. Am I correct? Okay. So what happens is this is ln of y equals x times the natural logarithm of the natural logarithm of x. So that is not ln of x times ln of x. That's x times the ln of the ln of x. So what does ln of ln of x mean? If I said what is ln of ln of 3, then you would go ln of 3 And then you would take the ln of that. Oops. Or you could go ln of ln of 3. OK, now we're ready to roll. This is a product. So I can differentiate the, right hand, the left hand side and write 1 over y dy dx. The derivative of the first is 1, because the first is x, times the ln of the ln of x. And I hope you're OK with me dropping this little set of brackets. OK. Plus, these are brackets. So I guess I don't need that set of brackets. Plus the first, which is x. Now things get interesting. What is the derivative of the natural logarithm of the natural logarithm of x? Okay, so the derivative of the ln of a thing is 1 over that thing. So the derivative of ln of ln of x is 1 over ln of x times the derivative of what we were taking the natural logarithm of, and we were taking the natural logarithm of the natural logarithm of x. So I have to multiply by the derivative of ln of x, which is 1 over x. Now we caught a break here, right? Because this, this reduces nicely. And what we're left with is dy dx equals y multiplied by the natural logarithm of the natural logarithm of x plus 1 over the natural logarithm of x.
I, I don't really see any point in trying to bring those two terms together here. Um, I would just leave it there. I'm curious, though, is that what the answer is in the back? Does anybody know? It is. Thank you, Grant. Yep. So just clarification here, if it's a written response, you do not have to substitute y back in. y was ln of x quantity to the x. Okay, so what I'm saying is, what, what Ben is asking is, do we need to put this y back in And my answer is on a written response, no, you do not. Okay? This is perfectly fine. Yeah. Three. three. Okay, let's take a look at three. So we want the equation of a tangent line. Look, other than the function being this bizarre x to the x idea, we still fall back on using this formula as a method for finding the equation of a line and knowing that one of our goals is to determine the slope of the tangent and one of the goals is to determine the coordinates of a point on the tangent line. Well, the goal number two is done because you're told the line is tangent at the point 2 comma 4. We don't even need to waste our energy checking, but we could if you put 2 in for x, do you get y equals 4? We'll, we'll have 2 to the 2, which is 4. So really our success here hinges on us being able to determine the slope. But the slope will be equal to the derivative at x equals 2. Same as probably a week, in, a week into this course, except a week into this course when we did this, we did it with secants approaching tangents, and it was a mess. Okay, so what's the derivative? y equals x to the x when I take the natural logarithm of both sides. I get the natural logarithm of x to the x on the right. I can move that exponent down now and write ln of y equals x ln x. And I can start differentiating. The derivative of the ln of y is 1 over y. This is a product. Don't forget to follow the rules. It's Sometimes you get so caught up in, oh, logarithmic differentiation, that you do something foolish. And that's foolish, right? Don't do that. The derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Uh, Evan, did you have a question? Thank you. That would have, I would have caught that in all fairness because I want to find the slope and I would have said, where's my dy dx? Thank you, dy dx. Okay, so what is dy dx? It's y times ln of x plus 1. And here's a perfect example why, Ben, who cares if we put x to the x back in? Because we know y is 4. Right? The point, the point passes through, or the line passes through, 2 comma 4. So we can just put 2 in for x and 4 in for y. And we end up with... We end up with dy dx equals 4 times ln 2 plus 1. Now, you've been in this course long enough to know that we're not going to plug that into our calculator and get decimals. Okay. Grant, did you ask about this? Okay. We're not going to put this into our calculator and get decimals. We want exact values. So now what do I know? I know x1 is 2 
y1 is 4, the slope happens to, well, the slope is right there. This is the slope. I need to put those three quantities into y minus y1 equals slope times x minus x1. And this is, you know, you may have noticed this, you may not have. As we got deeper into the course and as we continue to get deeper, I'm not going to do stuff like this as examples. I'm going to teach you the basics and you've got to work it out on your own. And then we'll go over it like we are now. In other words, this is fair game on an exam. It's a good written response question, actually. So I have y minus 4 equals the slope, which is 4, which is 4 times ln of 2 minus 1. You know, I suppose you could multiply that 4 through, and in fact, we're probably going to end up doing the equivalent of that in a second, times x minus 2. We want equations of lines to be written in one of these two ways. You can't just leave it there. So I, I'm a big fan of the AX plus BY plus C thing. That's where I'm going to go. But I need to multiply all this stuff out. So I'm going to FOIL this out, and then I'm going to multiply that by 4. It's going to be a hodgepodge of different terms. You know, I get ln 2 times x, which is x ln 2. There's my f. Outer will be the product here and here, which is minus 2 ln 2. Inner is this product and this or this product of negative 1 times x. And last, of course, is negative 1 times negative 2, which is 2. And I need to multiply that by 4. And it's equal to y minus 4. Double check my FOIL. You should do the same. I see, I see 2 ln 2, and I just want to write ln 4. Obviously, I've written something down wrong. Let me see if I can find it first. What's the problem? Is it ln 2 plus 1? It is. OK. Look at that. Thank you. Plus, which makes this plus, this minus, we'll double, I'll double check everything now. Is that better, you guys? OK. Um, I see 2 ln 2, and my brain sees ln 4. We can bring that 2 up and combine the two 2's as 2 to the 2. So I get y minus 4 equals, now I'm going to multiply this 4 through, 4x ln 2 minus 8. Well, man, I don't know. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do this thing here right now. I'm just going to leave it as 2 ln 2 times the 4 is minus 8 ln 2. And then I have plus the 4x and minus the 8. So times 4, times 4, times 4, times 4. So I get 0 equals 4x ln 2 plus 4x. I'm just putting my x terms first. Then I put my y term, which is minus y. Then I put all of my constants, which will be 4, will be negative 4. A lot going on here. I have negative 8 on the right, and I have negative 4 on the left. So if I add 4 to both sides, I get negative 4. And I also have negative 8 ln 2. Just step back and make sure I got them all.
doesn't matter where you put that negative 8 ln 2 and the negative 4. Um, I think that's fine. There's a lot of things you could do here. Just so you know. Sometimes you would see this because it's supposed to be the coefficient of x times x, so you could factor the x out. Um, you could also write this 4 ln 2 as ln of 16 because 2 to the 4 is 16. You could write the 8 ln 2 as 2 to the 8, which is, I think, 64. Liam's going to find out for us. 256. Boy, was I ever off. You could write that um, 8 ln 2 as ln of 256. But I would say that's good enough there. And by the way, you know, if you, I don't know. If you left it here, I'm really tempted to say you understand the math 31. You know, put an X saying simplify next time, but I probably wouldn't take marks off. Other questions? Okay, so uh, as I said at the start of this class today, the way that you're going to get better and better and do as well as you can on this exam is to do, do the math, right? Do lots of math. Uh, so for the remainder of today and tomorrow, you're working on review. I have two practice handouts. Uh, tomorrow I will talk about the structure of the exam. Both of these handouts have sample multiple choice, sample numerical response, and sample written response. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Ben is asking at the bottom of the screen here where we have 4x ln 2, could we move just the 4 up and have x times the ln of 2 to the 4, or x ln 16? And the answer is definitely you could. Okay, I'll come around with the second one now. This is a perfect example of what I was talking about in terms of simplifying a function first. So this is question number two on the second review package. Um, what you want to do, I guess, is always have a little curiosity about the function before you dive in to differentiating. Can we simplify this? Is there something we can do with this? Well, it's a natural logarithm of a quotient, so I can write this as the natural logarithm of the numerator minus the natural logarithm of the denominator. And this is why the natural logarithm of e to the x is simply x, so now we have the following. Now I can differentiate 1 over y. Oops. So we're not differentiating logarithmically. We didn't take the log of both sides. I just have y. The derivative of y is dy dx equals 1 minus the derivative of ln of e to the x minus 1 is 1 over e to the x minus 1 times the derivative of e to the x minus 1, which is 
e to the x. Are you with me so far? So we get 1 minus e to the x over e to the x minus 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 minus e to the x over e to the x minus 1. And it's so tempting to look at choice A and go, well, yeah, maybe it's A. It's very close, but it's not A. It's not x minus e to the x over e to the x minus 1. I think what you need to explore now is what happens if you find a common denominator and put them together. And you can see what's going to happen. I'm going to have to take that 1 over 1 and multiply by e to the x minus 1 over e to the x minus 1 to get the denominator that the other fraction has. So now I have dy dx is equal to e to the x minus 1 over e to the x minus 1 minus e to the x over e to the x minus 1. And you can see that you get negative 1 on top of e to the x minus 1. Is that okay? Yeah, um, that's life, right? Uh, sometimes you encounter that, that a person says, and I don't, it's been a long time since I've made this up, so I don't remember what my thoughts were when I had this. But a person says, myself included, what's a way that you can minimize the number of negatives? And one of the ways is to take the negative out of the bottom, cancel it with the negative on the top, to get negative 1 and then negative 1. The e to the x becomes negative. The 1 on the bottom becomes positive. So you're left with that. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at number 5 on the first handout. No. Um, maybe some of the most easily misunderstood ideas in trigonometry revolve around reciprocal trig ratios. Very easily misunderstood. Uh, the question being asked right now is if you have y equals x cosine of 1 over x, can we write this cosine as secant because it's 1 over? The answer is no. The, the idea behind secant is that, I'll use cosine, is that the relationship between cos and secant is that cos of a thing is equal to 1 over the secant of that thing. But that thing stays the same. It isn't that we're flipping the argument over and changing it from cosine to secant. You have to flip the whole trig ratio over. So unfortunately, there's nothing, there's nothing you can really do here other than to think of this that way. And I think you could finish it on your own, but I'm going to continue anyway because I see a few other people following along. D well, we have to find dy dx here, Naya and everybody, because you want the slope of the tangent. So you need to find the derivative and then put in the value that x is, which is 2 over pi. So dy dx, it's a product, the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. What is the derivative of the second? Boy, be careful with these simple cosine sine derivatives. The derivative of cosine is negative sine of the argument times 
the derivative of the argument. So what is the derivative of x to the negative 1? It's negative 1 x to the negative 2. And although we don't really need to simplify anything here because we're going to put in, is it 2 over pi? We're going to put in 2 over pi. I think it serves you well to simplify things a little bit. This is cosine of the reciprocal of x. This is the negative times the negative cancels, so you get a positive. This is sine of the reciprocal of x, and it's over x. And the reason it's over x, not that it's going to matter, and I'll show you why in a second, is that this is x to the 1, this is x to the negative 2, which gives you x to the negative 1, which is 1 over x. When you put in 2 over pi, a big part of me, Naya and everybody, wants to simply write this. When I'm putting in x equals 2 over pi, and my i looks up here and sees 1 over x, that means I'm putting the reciprocal of x in. But if you wanted to, you could do this. And then, oh man, I think you're just making things more difficult by doing that. You know, multiply by the reciprocal, multiply top and bottom by pi, it's up to you. And then we have plus sine of pi over 2 for the same reason. The reason why I said I really don't care about the x is because sine of pi over 2 is 0. No, I'm wrong. It's not. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. Cos of pi over 2 is 0. So these are the little things that I, I don't want to say. I don't want to say the trig in Math 30 is important for this exam. It's just little tiny things are. Like at this point, you need to be able to say that this is 0 plus this is 1 over x, which is 2 over pi. So we're left with 0 plus the reciprocal of 2 over pi, which means the answer is pi over 2. Yeah? <laughs> well, you know what I wanted to say over here? And I'm getting, as students get craftier and craftier over the years, I follow their lead and try to design questions that makes it more difficult to do. Um, what Liam is saying is you can graph this and then go to your calculate menu and calculate the value of the slope and then just compare the decimal value you get. And, you know, I, I'm not going to just ignore that. It, it's a legitimate, if you have technology, it's what it's there for. So, so I'm going to graph y equals x cos 1 divided by x. And I'm going to go zoom trig, because that's what we do. I'm a little puzzled by that. I'm going to try zoom standard. I, I want to avoid something here. Okay, so there it is, okay? And we're going to go to the Calculate menu. And we're going to calculate dy dx when x is 2 over pi. And get the wrong answer. Now, I don't know if you saw what I did. I'm in degree mode. Okay, so I, I, I kind of I kind of tried to stand in front of it while I went into degree mode, and you know you could tell I was up to something, and you could see it up here, right? Um, so you do have to be in radian mode, and again, I don't like to get into it. It isn't it isn't because there's a pi in the question. It's got nothing to do with it, nothing at all to do with it. Um, and by the way, if you were in degree mode and you put in 2 over 180, thinking you could be clever, it still wouldn't work. So 
Now we can go here and do this. And I'm not done. There's something else I want to address here. Um, I did go back into radians, didn't I? Yep. So calculate dy dx at 2 over pi. And you get that. And then you can check your answers. And that number is, in fact, pi divided by 2. Um, can you use that strategy here? I think, you know, what I'm showing you here, guys, is a, a mark saver. If I'm going to be, f I mean, I hope that you can do this on paper. But I admit this is a difficult question. <clears throat> if you want to know what the derivative is and you have the wherewithal, the fortitude, what you can do is this. You can graph y equals ln of e to the x divided by bracket e to the x minus 1 close brackets on everything, go zoom 6, there's something there, and do something like this. Go to your calculator. I'm going to zoom in. Go to your calculate menu. This is the function whose derivative you want to find. Now, you're cheating here, but you're allowed to cheat because I'm giving you a graphing calculator. I tried teaching this course one semester by just handing out non-graphing calculators, and it didn't go over very well. I can go to my Calculate menu and choose dy dx and find the slope of the tangent at some ambiguous value of x, some arbitrary value of x. So x equals... 0.8. The slope is that. One of these, A, B, C, or D, if I put 0.8 in, will give me that number. I'm not going to do that. It's a clunky method, but it will work. 